Oh, hi there. This right here is a molecule particle. And a whole lot of them make up our fluid. In this series we simulate fluids, but taking care of each molecule, this is way too much information to keep track of. In the last part we learned what the particles represent. Convenient storage quantities derived deep down from quantum mechanics. They provide a high level perspective on the subatomic origin. The same line of thinking about reducing information will help us in this part to come up with a new perspective, a reduced representation of the same fluid. In the end, we will sacrifice the molecules to get a clearer view on the overall fluid behavior. Look closely. Actually, look less closely. By zooming out we see the overall flow pattern without focusing on the underlying molecules anymore. Much like you wouldn't recognize individual pixels to get an idea of a picture. It looks as if neighboring pixels or molecules average into a condensed form of information. Ok, in terms of macroscopic information we get a cleaner view by averaging. Sounds reasonable. But how is it done? Mathematically, how do we derive a new perspective on fluids? And on top of that, if the essential information of a fluid is extracted, shouldn't this be enough to directly compute future states of essential information, bypassing any underlying molecular simulations? All of these questions are linked to the macroscopic perspective, and in this part we develop it step by step. My goal here is that by the end of this video, you will have an intuitive understanding of the macroscopic perspective and can appreciate why it is so useful for simulating fluids. Alright, let's get started. And we start simple. These are 1000 identical molecule particles in a two dimensional box. And we use this box to gain basic insights into fluid behavior. Once we are clear about the fundamentals, the new perspective can be derived in a straightforward way. So let's just kick off a portion of these particles and see what happens. Apparently they bounce around and after some period of time there seems to be no difference in the particle distributions anymore. As if any initial characteristics are redistributed. Let's kick off some differently shaped portions. This process of redistribution seems to be a common theme here. The fluid box always ends up like this. To see what's going on, let's characterize it using a specific data representation. This here is the same box, but we use a third dimension to mark the magnitude of velocity vectors, the speeds. So collision induced velocity jumps are on this representation indeed jumps. And we will look at this box from two sides. From the top to see the full position space and from one side to see speeds along one position axis. And we count particles in different regions to be a bit more quantitative here. Now as we observe the redistribution process again, not only the position but also the speed distribution settle to a very distinct shape. No matter how we kick off the particles, the initial distortions are always smoothed out again. Why is it? There must be a microscopic mechanism behind this. Well, in terms of positions, particles may spread in any direction, but it is far more likely to get pushed away from energetic occupied regions, meaning there is a natural probabilistic tendency to even out the position distribution. And in terms of speeds, intuitively speaking, faster particles are more likely to be slowed down and slower particles are more likely to be sped up. Think of the limit cases. It is very unlikely that a comparatively fast particle gets hit, collision angle and speed wise making it even faster. And for a resting particle, any collision will speed it up. Following a cascade of mixing collisions, a stationary distribution establishes. So with time, positions and speeds tend to equilibrate and the fluid is said to be in equilibrium. But it is very much by the number of particles and their collisions to give meaning to this term in the first place. If there are not enough particles to interact, how should coordinated distributions establish? Interestingly, even if a fluid is said to be in equilibrium, the limited non-infinite particle number makes it fluctuate around the theoretical distributions for equilibria. In fact, equilibria could be left completely, although the statistical rarity of this happening renders these scenarios irrelevant for practical purposes. Nonetheless, as we start focusing more on statistics, it is clear that individual molecules only matter as they give rise to the overall fluid. Even if we wanted to predict precise individual molecular motion, the same initialization will deterministically lead to the same result. But the slightest initial perturbation leads rapidly to completely different molecular states, although the drawn distributions are similar. 
So that's molecular chaos in action. And given we want to study large amounts of fluids, the focus should not be on distinct molecules, but rather on their collective behavior, expressed through robust statistics. And more so, initial perturbations are unavoidable here anyway, since the particles are merely crude approximations to their quantum mechanical origin. They are designed to make the overall fluid work globally, totally accepting there will be some local differences. So again, the particles are important, but only as they give rise to their collection. With these basics in mind, let's focus on our main goal here, reducing information, by looking at this equilibrated fluid portion. To fully describe this fluid, we use 1000 location and velocity pairs, and we restrict our view to locations for now. Now thinking statistically, for such homogeneously distributed locations, we could likewise store one particular value, an average occupation per fluid volume, which quite well represents how much particles there are on average. We don't need to look at the actual molecule locations anymore. But this only holds if the particle locations are distributed homogeneously. For an inhomogeneous distribution, caused for instance by gravity, the average value is the same, but represents only a fraction of that fluid at best. Let's ignore external forces for now. Now looking at the speeds, we see the typical non-uniform distribution, but it is valid throughout the fluid. This characteristic also appears homogeneously. We will uncover convenient quantities for speed representation later on, here we assume them as given. To sum up, for homogeneous fluid states, such as unforced fluids in equilibrium, locations and speeds are well described by a few characteristic quantities. And the consequence here is, the closer the fluid is to such an equilibrium, the more accurate the average representation gets, and the more it is justified to store fluid properties using a few average values. But if you think about it, aren't we interested in non-equilibrated fluid flows? We want to see what happens to a fluid in motion, a fluid like this, which is certainly not close to equilibrium. Neither locations nor speeds are distributed as we would expect for equilibria. So is the whole averaging idea useless here? Well, here's a clue. While the whole fluid may not be in equilibrium, portions of it can very well be close enough to equilibrium, locally equilibrated so to speak, meaning position and speed characteristics show at least locally near homogeneity. This is possible if there happen to be enough molecule collisions that equilibrate the fluid locally, despite having some global dynamics going on. The equilibration process simply averages throughout the fluid, implying that smaller fluid portions even out faster, given enough collisions. So as unreasonable as it seems to attribute average numbers based on the whole fluid, as reasonable it is to attribute multiple sets of these numbers, one for each box, and this quite well represents what happens globally. So the averaging is useful if applied locally. But this leads to a very practical problem. To get a meaningful average value, we need enough things that we can average over. So if a significant change in flow characteristics is not accompanied and not populated by enough molecules, then we are in an actual dilemma. Using a statistically more powerful larger local region, the computed averages are not representative here. The larger local region is not equilibrated, there is simply too much variation in the box. Now in general, a smaller local region should equilibrate more quickly, thereby providing representative averages, if there are enough molecules to be equilibrated in the first place. But here, there aren't. The molecules here pass slightly smaller regions without participating in enough locally equilibrating collisions. Of course, this eventually happens even for locally equilibrated fluids just make the local region smaller and smaller. But this here is different. For this fluid, at no length scale we find enough particles to establish a local equilibrium. The global flow characteristic significantly overlaps with the molecular path length, so we cannot resolve it statistically meaningful due to having comparatively few molecules. This fluid is not just globally non-equilibrated, but even locally non-equilibrated, meaning both location and speed characteristics vary significantly at all length scales. So thinking in equilibria is not really helpful here. Unfortunately, despite having locally too few molecules, in general there will be nonetheless too many molecules forming the whole fluid, meaning we still need some kind of averaging here. Then how do we deal with such a situation? 
Well, here's the idea and it comes in two parts. First, we really need to acknowledge that due to having too few molecules, the fluid does not equilibrate locally. Therefore, the location-based averages useful for equilibria are not enough to capture the essential information within a local box in a meaningful representative way. Look at the previous fluid column. Although the speed distribution varied slightly from box to box, it had locally still the typical equilibrium distribution just for different kinetic energies. This is not the case anymore and we really need a more general representation. We additionally need to account for significant differences of the underlying velocity distribution. Please note, the boxes are drawn here purely for visualization purposes in terms of position and speed, although under the hood we mean boxes living in position velocity space. Now this necessary first step shrinks the boxes and the number of particles within even further, making it even harder to get meaningful local averages. And that's where the second part comes in. Let's rethink averaging. Let's not average what is there, but what could be there. Our fluid, unique as it is, clearly has a global characteristic that other systems with different particle states but similar particle distributions also represent. There are many globally equivalent systems. The superimposed ensemble of all of these independently evolving systems leads to a time-dependent probability distribution representing how many particles there are on average in certain portions of the position velocity space, the so-called one-particle phase space. And how these probability distributions evolve with time is pretty much the bread and butter business of statistical mechanics. Mathematically, as we had time evolution equations for wave functions in quantum mechanics and particles in classical mechanics, there are evolution equations for such probability distributions themselves, the Boltzmann equation for instance. Apparently, the presence or absence of local equilibria allows for two very different approaches here. Locally non-equilibrated flows are treated within the field of rarefied gas dynamics where the focus is on the evolution of local averages in phase space. Locally equilibrated flows are well described by continuum gas dynamics that builds on the evolution of local averages in position space. Consequently, the decision on which approach to apply should consider how many molecules participate in establishing the global flow characteristic. Empirically, this can be quantified by the local Knudsen number, giving the ratio of the mean path length between collisions to the global flow length scale to get an idea of the relative abundance of particles. But you also have to consider other factors, such as the local times between collisions and the global flow time scale. A meaningful local equilibrium may just not establish quickly enough, even if the number of particles is right. So there's a range of conditions and fluid flows are not per se locally equilibrated or not. We will uncover more of these characteristic numbers in future parts, but we first need to develop the language for it. In this series we will settle for conditions that small aircrafts are exposed to instead of spacecraft re-entries and continuum gas dynamics will turn out to be the method of choice here. Before we go on, some words of caution here. In the last part we derived our molecular model under the assumption of spread out particles, which implied comparatively small collision times, which we then assumed as being effectively instantaneous. The approximation error was accounted for by selecting an effective collision radius to make this fluid match to a reference fluid in its global behavior. And this right here is very important. We know that our molecular model's motion deviates locally. We had to sacrifice a few things to get something in return. And by sacrificing certain molecular properties, we reduced in return the computational cost significantly, allowing us to study much larger chunks of fluid which are still globally equivalent. We will actually use this model under partly very compressed conditions, meaning with little particle spacing left, thereby stressing the assumptions to a not insignificant amount. We could account for that by adjusting the collision radius or simply by using a better model. But much more, we have to understand what our actual goal here is. It is not to build a fluid simulator, but to understand how to build one. And from an educational point of view, it can be helpful to see what's going on microscopically and macroscopically at the same time. If we have to sacrifice spacing and thus accuracy to get enough particles on a pixel limited screen, then maybe that's the way to go. The whole aspect of using models under off-reference conditions is related to the concept of model robustness and it is certainly on the list for another part. For now, we accept this model knowing that we could always revert and come up with a better alternative given our goal changes.
Now as we have an overview of the world where our macroscopic perspective will live in, position based averages, let's take a deeper look on continuum gas dynamics. And we start out with the elephant in the room. All reduction steps we performed in the last part led to models that operate on their own. Our specific molecular dynamics model operates without considering quantum mechanics anymore. Once initialized it does not need additional input. And the kinetic gas model, the model we use in this part, works without considering what the molecular dynamics model would do. But given the position based molecular averaging we discussed so far, this process is still attached to the underlying molecular motion. So the actual goal of the macroscopic perspective is not only to somehow give an average look on the molecular situation, but also to make it operate on its own, bypassing individual molecular computations completely. Any given average flow state should deterministically lead to a future average flow state. Otherwise it would just be a visual post-processing step, very instructive admittedly, but less helpful in terms of flow computations. We already saw for the rarefied gas dynamics example what this could look like and we need a similar tool for continuum gas dynamics. To accomplish all of this we need to take two steps here. First we derive several macroscopic quantities that help specifying what's going on microscopically on average. And second, we link all these quantities together by studying how they evolve with time synchronous to how the molecules evolve and we mimic this evolving behavior using macroscopic equations leading eventually to a model that operates on its own. A model without molecules. So let's start building the macroscopic quantities, which will be quite similar to the averaging from the beginning. Every particle as it moves around carries some inherent properties, such as its mass, velocity, which combined gives momentum and energy for instance. And some of these properties are quite important as they turn out to be conserved in total. But whatever properties we choose to observe, we need a measure of how they are distributed throughout the fluid. So the obvious thing to do is to accumulate the chosen particle property within a local fluid volume, assuming unit depth here for unit conformity, and divide that value by a representative quantity of the volume itself, such as the number of particles in it, the contained mass, or the volume of course. For instance, by relating the local particle masses to the local volume, this leads to the mass density, or just density for short, which is assigned to the center of the region. Now as we track the density while using a very small region, we immediately see it jumps and the underlying flow density is concealed by individual particle contributions. This is not the right starting point for a particle independent model. But since we assume local equilibrium and thereby implying local homogeneity, we know there must be a larger local region that in itself is homogeneous as it contains enough particles to provide a statistically meaningful average, otherwise we couldn't call it homogeneous in the first place. And using this larger local shape we now see how the underlying flow density is encoded. On the other hand, the assumption of local homogeneity for a globally inhomogeneous flow implies that this local volume, no matter how large it has to be, is still small compared to any global flow characteristic. But if this is the case, then from a macroscopic perspective we wouldn't even recognize what is happening within the local volume. It simply behaves as being a homogeneous portion of matter. So it could likewise contain many more molecules of the same total mass, momentum and energy or even a continuum of infinitely many molecules. The net effect it provides to the big picture is the same. That's why this approach is called continuum hypothesis. The fluid behaves as being a continuum of matter. And having virtually infinitely many particles, we can shrink the local volume to infinitesimal size and it would still contain enough particles. So we can assign a density value to each point in this fluid, thereby creating a smooth, time-dependent density field, our first macroscopic quantity. And simply by averaging different molecular properties, additional fields emerge. Here we pause time and indicate the particle velocities by vectors. As we sum up the local velocity vectors and divide by the number of particles, we see there is an average velocity component called flow velocity, which simply tells how the local particles move on average. The individual velocity deviation from that average velocity reflects the chaotic motion component. Summing up these deviations directly would just give a zero average. We already excluded the mean flow component and this provides no further insight. So it makes sense to sum up a property that quantifies the magnitude of deviation ignoring the direction. Well we can use the kinetic energy of the chaotic motion for that, which is based on the squared magnitude of deviation and is non-negative. 
and the local sum over these energies constitutes here the internal energy, which divided by the local mass is related to the temperature. So the complex individual molecular velocities are collectively characterized by the macroscopic fields of flow velocity and temperature. Ok, now we have location and motion related fields. How about interactions? Collisions turned out to be crucial, so let's quantify them. Imagine an ideally flat immovable wall. Once a particle hits the wall, its velocity and so its momentum is mirrored along the normal direction. We artificially prescribe the new momentum. But following the last part we know that momentum change can also be induced by a force acting over a period of time. And from a macroscopic perspective, for an ongoing stream of countless interactions, we aren't interested in individual collisions anyway. So using a sustained average force that implies the same average momentum change per time seems conceptually adequate. And as before, we should associate the property of interest, the average force, to the region it's related to, the area exposed to the stream. Now representing the area by the area scaled normal vector here, a single scalar quantity is needed to establish this link, and that's the pressure. And apparently, it's directly related to the particle number and speed. So simply having particles provides the potential to press, and the concept of a pressure field applies throughout the fluid. Intuitively, think of a fluid enclosed probe that senses a pressing via boundary collisions, and then think of this probe being just fluid itself. The particles may redistribute, but the nature of pressing does not magically disappear. In a sense, the particles themselves keep on sensing. So, our fluid is a continuum now. A completely artificial concept representing molecules collectively by a few characteristics. But let's step back for a second. We traded off a ginormous amount of molecules for a few fields with infinitely many points, rendering the evolution computationally intractable. How can this be a step forward? Well, in the next part we explore methods to break down the computational effort, but there's another huge benefit. Previously, the reduction steps were pretty much predetermined by the clustering of physical particles. It was natural to combine atom particles to molecule particles, so the computational speedup was predetermined as well. Now having replaced the molecules by an average perspective on them, lets us adjust the computational resolution based on our interest in certain flow characteristics, so we can control the speedup more freely. That's a huge step forward and it opens the doors for simulation of truly large scale that otherwise could not be tracked due to the sheer number of particles. So the continuum is helpful and we need to find its rules of evolution. We need equations that arrange the macroscopic quantities in a particular way, drawing a consistent picture of future continuum states, basically showing what the molecules collectively would have done without computing what all individual molecules would have done. And to somehow get to the grips with this task, let's state what we know for sure about the collective molecular behavior, and then we try to bake this knowledge into an equation, linking the macroscopic quantities. By accumulating this isolated fluid's mass, momentum and energy, we clearly see that these quantities stay globally constant, they are conserved in total. And we ignore momentum changes due to boundary forces here by using a cyclic formulation. So particles going out one side come back in the other side. If we look closely we see, local variations of these quantities are possible, as long as these evolve consistently along the fluid. For instance, mass does not suddenly appear out of nowhere, it must be conserved, so it is continuously redistributed throughout the fluid, passing local regions consistently. So this perspective seems promising. The global mass conservation property manifests in a local continuity property, providing a statement on how mass evolves locally. Now what might such a mass continuity equation look like? Let's have a look. As we consider macroscopic quantities and the continuum hypothesis, looking at the very small fluid box is conceptually representative for the whole continuum. And we start out with a purely x-directional flow and let density and flow velocity vary only in x-direction. During a super small time step, the mass entering the box equals the mass enclosing volume multiplied by an effective density. The volume in turn equals the surface area, not writing unit depth here, multiplied by the flow velocity and the time step. So as the time step tends to zero, the density and flow velocity are practically the ones evaluated at location A. 
Usually there is a mass flowing out of the box and most often these masses do not balance and this imbalance accumulates within the box. To capture this accumulation equation wise, we note a few things here. First, our continuous fields can be smoothly approximated using spatial derivatives. And if you zoom just far enough into a smooth function, it eventually appears locally linear. So for our super small size box, the super linear terms, the ones with the power, have no power here and the variation throughout the box is linear, meaning the first derivatives are effectively constant. Therefore, the field values on the right side are well expressed by a first order Taylor series expansion around the left side using the first derivative for the center point. Furthermore, density and flow velocity are multiplied anyway, leading to a new field that can be approximated as well. Now as we are interested in linking macroscopic quantities, simply by writing the mass accumulation rate per volume and substituting in the masses and the linearization, with just a little bit of rearranging we yield an expression for the rate of change of the density within the box, that's a macroscopic equation. And as we shrink the box conceptually to a point, this represents a density evolution equation valid for each point in this field, we are making progress here. But one thing at a time. Our field values may vary linearly along the surface too. But that's no problem. The implied mass transfer variation is self-compensating. The more mass is transferred at the top, the less is transferred at the bottom. The relevant average lies always on the center axis, along which the equation is evaluated anyway, as we think of shrinking it to a point, so it is still valid. And last but not least, it rarely happens that the flow is purely one directional, but our flow field can be split into x and y components, which are the relevant ones carrying mass through the box surfaces. So again, the structure of the equation is still valid, we just add the y component, completing our first macroscopic equation. If it looks a bit unfamiliar, don't let math notations distract you from what it means and what it is good for. It's simply mass continuity linking flow velocity to the density evolution, exactly the kind of equation we need. Now by studying the momentum and energy transfer, similar evolution equations appear providing further macroscopic links. But deriving these equations is more of a mathematical exercise. We are more concerned about what they physically represent. Unsurprisingly, the momentum continuity equations, known as the Navier-Stokes equations, resemble a form of Newton's second law of motion per volume. The left hand side represents mass times the acceleration of a moving fluid portion per volume in all independent directions and the right hand side represents related fluid forces per volume. Now evaluating derivatives while moving along with the flow rather than relative to a fixed position will be highlighted during the spatial discretization in the next part. For now just note, there's a distinction to be made when it comes to these derivatives. Now the fluid forces here may come from body forces such as gravity or from internal particle interactions. And to intuitively see how the microscopic origin implies macroscopic interaction forces, we look at two of them in more detail. By prescribing a gradually changing pressure field along the x direction and tracking the average velocity of a few marked particles, we see it changes with time, although quite erratically due to the limited particle number. Now over a short period of time, we can imply an equivalent but smooth velocity increase by assuming a constant effective acceleration value. And here's the bottom line. This acceleration occurs always in the same direction as the pressure drops, so there might be a link. Thinking macroscopically, a very small moving fluid portion is effectively accelerated by the net force on the fluid portion. And as a fluid portion passes a local box of the same size, the net force simply results from the pressure distribution acting right at that time instant along the box surface. Now by realizing that the top and bottom surface feel the same pressing here, merely the pressure difference between the left and right surface yield a net force. And again, as we are interested in the net force per volume, by using the linear approximation of the field values and assembling all the expressions, we find the first force term for the momentum evolution equation linking pressure to the flow velocity. And by the same logic we used for mass continuity, this term is still valid for any continuous pressure variation. We just need to consider the y component again. <laughs> 
The momentum equations are here separated into x and y components though, since the momentum conservation holds direction-wise. For the mass continuity, well, it is irrelevant where the mass comes from, so both components contribute into the same single equation. Okay, we almost have the ingredients we need. From now on, deriving more of these terms is basically the same story. Microscopic motion implies macroscopic terms, depending on the molecular model. Here we focus on one more term in detail. It will have important consequences later on. This fluid is separated by a membrane into two layers, where the implied density, temperature and pressure are constant up to little fluctuations. Merely the x components of the flow velocity, including the boundary velocities, vary significantly. Now by removing the membrane, it's clear what happens. The particles entrain each other, the flow velocity averages out, and with time, a stationary flow velocity profile establishes. Apparently, the chaotic microscopic molecular motion blurs or diffuses the macroscopic flow characteristics with time. Now as we try to capture this process macroscopically, we should note, the velocity profile converges to a linear form, at least for small ratios of flow speed to chaotic speed. So to mimic this converging behavior, we can use any remaining local nonlinearity of the profile as an artificial driving force, working to diminish this nonlinearity, ultimately leading to a linear form. Considering the spatial approximation for our continuum, the next most significant term following the linear one is the second order term, so maybe this scaled second derivative will do the job. Intuitively, you can think of a linear profile simply as having velocity components that equal the average of neighboring velocity components. And in this sense, any continuous deviation from that linearity thereby encodes a difference between the neighbor average and the center value. And using this difference as a driving force to get rid of the difference seems reasonable. Of course, neighbors along x direction should be considered too, and by adding the y component we link flow velocity to flow velocity, using a scaling factor called viscosity. The approach shown here is of course purely phenomenological. It is meant to convey the idea that microscopic interaction is macroscopically expressible. There are far more mathematically involved derivations nonetheless. And in general, the momentum equation might be refined by additional terms, and some of the effects manifest in the energy continuity equation as well, which thereby resembles the first law of thermodynamics accounting the rate of change of the local energy here. I didn't want to introduce a new macroscopic energy quantity here though, so we directly express energy as some function of temperature and flow velocity. To give a glimpse on one such energy contribution in action, as the fluid layers mix under faster boundary speeds, a nonlinear temperature profile establishes, leading to viscous dissipation. We may occasionally look into more of these terms in detail. For now, let's just pretend that we have the complete continuity equations, evolving density, flow velocity and implicitly temperature. But what about pressure? It does not evolve. We have no equation for that. Furthermore, we learned, diffusion is caused by the chaotic motion, thereby running faster for higher temperature. How is that linked to the viscosity? So we need further equations that follow reasonable assumptions. One such assumption we already discussed extensively, the reducibility of microscopic states to a few macroscopic quantities in a state of equilibrium. So depending on different equilibrium states, there must be links to uncover. For instance, simply by increasing the number of particles, thus increasing density, our fluid presses a bit more. But here we assume constant temperature. If we change it too, iterating over density and temperature and waiting for equilibration, we can basically read off the pressure. So there is indeed a relation between the state variables density, temperature and pressure. And as we evolve density and temperature, we can use this equation of state to determine the updated pressure. Now there are certainly many more of these kinds of equations. For instance, our little energy temperature flow velocity link here must come from somewhere. The full spectrum of formulations and levels of approximation will unveil to us as we approach this model numerically in the upcoming parts. But with a bit of imagination here, we can already declare our macroscopic model educationally complete. That is a macroscopic perspective. Interacting fluid fields providing a consistent, average look on the molecular behavior, without ever considering any molecules again. In the next part we make all this numerically accessible, reducing the fields to a limited number of these little moving points. What are these fluid points actually? Let's sum up what we learned so far. By looking at the chaotic molecular motion, we realize microscopic particulars are dispensable in search for a comprehensive statistical perspective. 
following the notion of equilibria, we eventually describe particles collectively. We even extended that idea coming up with fields representing the molecular location, motion and interaction continuously throughout space. Yet without interconnections, the fields were static and lifeless. To bring them to life, we expressed fundamental physical truth, condensed bare essentials into equations, thereby linking the fields. And we performed all these steps with the goal of sacrificing information, embracing model errors in pursuit of performance, asking ourselves how much of being wrong are we willing to accept. While embracing being wrong but fast when it comes to unnecessary details, we can afford being right when it comes to the big picture. Fluid dynamics is more than just many molecules, and we have to let go to look beyond. See you in the next part.